everyone who attended last year and convinced First Five to, for whatever reason, bring me back. Uh, the package deal, and I know the real reason that you guys brought me back. It was so I could bring my girls with me. And, and so, yes, so if you've seen us run around, so it's me, my wife, Michaela, who is with our youngest child right now. Um, they're gonna be popping in here very soon and you will hear her when she makes her entrance, that being our youngest baby. Um, my wife, Michaela, me, Lanaya, my oldest daughter right there, and then Tatum is with Michaela and my sister, Mikkel, is right there. She is, if you had a chance to hear us speak or hear me speak last year, that is the daughter of my high school football coach. So that is my sister there, my family. And uh, she is a teacher, uh, she teaches middle school, which, yeah, wow, right? <laughs> like, good for her. Um, but she's on spring break and she chose to, uh, come journey along with us in, in the Elmore clan. So uh, again, wow, good for her. She, she likes to make tough decisions. Um, no, I get a chance to talk to you about the power of choosing belonging, the power of belonging. And I think it's gonna go really, really well with everything you've already heard today and yesterday. There are so many things from MC and from Georgie that I've thought about through the context of what does this look like for the belonging work that I'm a part of and what does it look like for you day to day? And I think it's just gonna fold in really, really well so that you can continue to make the difference in the lives of the young, young children that have brought you here today. So I'm totally aware that there are caregivers in this room, that there are uh, profession, youth serving professionals in this room, and, and really belonging is something that we all need to thrive in life. If we're thinking about human flourishing, belonging is something that we all need. The difference between us and maybe the young people that have brought you into the room today, is not that we have different levels of belonging necessity or belonging need, it's just the different ways that that belonging has been met or not met throughout our lives. I believe that people are successful because of the support they have in life, the belonging that they've experienced in life, not they're successful in spite of it. So think about the young people that have brought you into this room today. Think about yourself as we have this conversation today. It's all about how has belonging elevated me so I can show up in life at my full and best self and how can I, going forward, be a part of that equation for the young people that I'm in relationship with? Because belonging is the thing that elevates us. It's the thing that gives us full access to our full potential, gives us access to our cortex, allows our brain to work in the ways that MC talked about. So this is a conversation I wanna to have today, and, and I'm gonna share bits and pieces of my story of someone who, very early in my life, found that I lacked belonging in a lot of ways, but how it became this safety net, this thing that protected me against long-term harmful traumatic experiences. But before we do that, I'm going to need you to participate in an activity with me. We're going to work off that lunch we just had. It was great. Thanks to all the staff that are making sure we're well fed. My daughter was very delighted to see that there was brownies when she came back. <laughs> I, I couldn't partake in the brownies. I'd be up here uh, having a sugar rush, but I want to start with this activity. We're just going to jump right into it. So there's this quote that I love from Benjamin Franklin, and I think it's hilarious. He says, there are two guarantees and there's no guarantees in life, but in this world, nothing can be certain but death and taxes, right? We, obviously, death is an adverse thing. And taxes, I don't know anyone that enjoys taxes, right? So in, in a nutshell, I think Benjamin Franklin, the founding father, is talking about adversity, right? There are so many other things that can fall in this category of, of adversity, but the reality is we experience adverse things all the time. An adverse thing that you might experience is, hey, he talked about brownies. I went to the table, there weren't any left. That's adversity. Should have been faster. Right? But to, to jump into this idea of adversity, I'm going to put you in this context of being very uncomfortable. And it's going to happen through this activity that I call your good. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to split the, the room in half. So I'm looking at the trash cans right there. I'm going to split the room in half. If you are on this side, let's see, Townley, what number do you want to be? One or two. <laughs> 
Two, okay, Townley, Townley's to blame for all the twos. You're gonna be two if you're on this side of the trash cans in me. If you're on this side of the trash cans in me, you're a one. What is about to happen is you have, if you're a two, you have 90 seconds to think of the best fun fact about yourself. Best one fact? Fun fact, F-U-N. The best fun fact about yourself. I'm not gonna give you a criteria on the fun fact. I'm gonna act like I don't see a bunch of two slouching in their seat when they realize that you have to share a fun fact about yourself, but that's what we're gonna do. And remember, we're gonna mirror each other, right? We're gonna have high energy. And so 90 seconds, I'm stalling, so you can think of the best fun fact about yourself. Once, what's gonna happen for you is you're gonna spread throughout the room when I say go, not yet, you're gonna spread throughout the room, you're gonna hold up your one finger, and twos are gonna come find you and share their fun fact that they came up with. Okay. Now here's where it gets uncomfortable for you. You have to tell them if it was fun or not. <laughs> Literally, you have to give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down based on the fun fact that they shared with you. I, hey, I'm just, I'm just a facilitator, I'm not, you cannot blame me. Townley chose a number, she chose two. So, you're gonna, you're gonna give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you get one thumbs down, you can continue to play. If you get a second thumbs down from someone, you have to sadly take a walk of shame back to your seat. So you only get one chance to mess up. After that, you're playing for keeps. Now, here's the thing that we get in the Midwest. I'm from the Midwest. Here's the thing that we kind of get. We get people being very kind of passive aggressive. You get people that are like, I don't really like that fun fact, but I'm, a, I'm scared of conflict, so I'm not gonna give you a thumbs down. <laughs> I need my ones over here to stand confidently and boldly in your idea of fun. Okay, and if you wanna choose either one or two to not participate for whatever reason, I give you that freedom to. I'm not gonna force everybody to but hopefully social pressure makes most of us participate. <laughs> okay, that is plenty enough time. I need my ones to stand up, move throughout the room, please. Twos, after you get a thumbs up or your first thumbs down, you go to a new person and you continue going until you have no one left to go to or until you get sat down for the, or get a thumbs down for the second time. All right, now twos, get up, go find a one, share your fun fact. It's fun fact speed dating. <laughs> we have a lot of lonely ones over there. Is that your first one? Yeah. Then keep going. If you get a second one, have a seat. Just get a... Nice. So if you're a two, keep going until you either get two thumbs down or you get through everybody. If you get thumbs up, keep going. Keep going until you get two thumbs down. difficulty, I need you to jump to that, that high level of difficulty with your criteria. So ones, make, raise the bar. That same fun fact that I like to knit is not going to continue to get you going. Raise the bar. <laughs> 
I'm not judging. <laughs> I do, yes. Where are you from? Again? Minnesota. Minnesota. Yes. Um, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis. Twin cities. Yep. My husband's family, they were from Red Wing, Minnesota. Oh, yeah, I'm very familiar. So I went to high school in Wisconsin, the western western border, so very familiar with Red Wing. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Fun fact. That is a fun fact. Okay, finish your final conversation. Ones, if you don't have anyone that's talking to you right now, feel free to go back to your seat. Thank you for participating. For anyone else who's still in the middle of conversation, finish it if you would like. Yes, please. I can't wait to hear it. Okay, energy is still high after doing that activity. You guys aren't ready to hurt me, which is great. I know this is a safe space now. How many of our twos, as soon as you heard what you had to do, like your, your heart dropped into your stomach? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. So I, I know you've heard a lot of uh, different metaphors, ways of explaining adversity, trauma, those kind of things today. I wanna, I wanna introduce one more that I, I really relate to on a personal level. Uh, but this idea of adversity, something that is difficult or misfortunate in our experience, can feel like a free fall sometimes. Anyone willing to be vulnerable and admit that you've leaned too far back in one of your chairs at one point in your life and you lost control for a second? That little moment of you not knowing what was about to happen is stressful. It is adverse. And so I like to think of adversity as this idea of a free fall. So when we learned that two who's had to share uh, intimate, potentially vulnerable, Fun fact about yourself with these judgmental ones over here, <laughs> some of you started to stress out. Some of you might have sweat a little bit. Some of you started to think about how well can I lie right now? <laughs> Someone lied. Someone fibbed a little, just a little, little tiny lie. But adversity is something that we all experience. There are people over here who may have been labeled judgmental at some point. There are ones who felt the same kind of adversity when you realize you had to tell someone to their face. No, go have a seat. Now there are people who, as a one, you might have felt more comfortable if you were in the shoes of a two. There is someone who's a two that would have been like, I would love and thrive to be a one right now. Right? There's adversity that is taking place. But to continue in this concept, you had this opportunity to be resilient. You had an opportunity to lean in, to press into this thing that you're experiencing. The definition of resilience here, the capacity of people to, to successfully adapt and recover, even in the face of highly st stressful and traumatic experiences. So some of you were able to be resilient. Some of who got a thumbs down and kept going? Yes. Slow clap. There were people. Oh, they made you tell a different fun fact, right? Who? It wasn't fun enough. Okay. Do you want to point them out? We can. No, it's okay. So, some of you had the opportunity to be resilient, to continue to 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 lean into the uncom discomfort that we were feeling, to lean into that free fall that we might have been navigating. And so resilience in the life of the children, the young people that we bring us here today, might look like the commitment to continue to get up and go into education. Maybe they've experienced some free falls. Maybe there are moments in their day-to-day -day life where they have no control and they've continued to get up and press forward. We know that a lot of us are here in this room because they've experienced some traumatic adversity in their life. We are here because we're learning how to best help them respond and show up even in spite of the things they had to overcome in their life. And so resilience is often this response toward adversity in our life. 
And it might mean for us that you show up at work even though you're going through hard things at home. It might mean that you are still committed to a relationship even though they might have let you down in the past. It's the ability to continue to show up. And so in this small little context, I showed you that people had to be resilient. How many people didn't get enough? How many people got two thumbs down? Were they immediate? Like, were they back to back, thumbs down? Mine were. Yours were? Okay, are you willing to share your fun fact with me? Sure. And I can share it with everyone else? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, I said I can do the alphabet backwards. You can do the alphabet backwards? Can you do it fast? Yep. Okay. Is that a fun fact to the, yeah. to the group? <laughs> You're getting some, some affirmation here. Yeah. What was your name? Tara. But Tara got sat down on back to back or <laughs> back-to-back encounters. Did you share the same fun fact both times? Yeah. Okay. So even though the collective group might believe that that is a fun fact, the people that you went to could care less. They did not like it. They went, I'm not going to put her in that situation. Someone's like, prove it. <laughs> Maybe at the end. I would love to do that. Um, but the reality is, Someone might say, if you got a thumbs down the first time, you should probably change your fun fact, mm -hmm. right? Someone might make that argument. Did anyone change their fun fact after getting the first, their first thumbs down? You had, you had to change it. Yeah, they forced you to. Anyone else? Okay. How many, how many people over here didn't give a thumbs down to anybody? A good majority. It was just like, you get a thumbs up, you get a thumbs up, everybody gets a thumbs up. Okay. Could our, could our twos identify the people that were just handing out thumbs up approval left and right? And you might have strategically went that way a little bit. I just want to say, fun is a rather subjective. Oh. What is your name? My name is Karen. Karen. So Karen thinks that fun is subjective. How many people agree? Okay, I think you have a majority. I didn't determine what was fun. I didn't give you a definition of what was fun. So for those, basically Karen, who was, you were a one, correct? Karen is saying, for the ones who gave people a thumbs down, get over yourself. But like you think you have a definition that is better than this idea of fun being subjective. But the rules or the instructions might have been, hey, you had to give some people some thumbs down. Okay, I, I appreciate that, Karen, because I agree, it is subjective. But also this idea of resilience can be subjective too, right? My, what I have to respond to, the things that I might have to overcome may not be the same as the other person's next to me. So my willingness to continue to show up in spite of the circumstances in my life, my ability to continue to withstand them, outside looking in might be seen as, oh, that's a resilient young person. But what about the person who wasn't resilient enough to overcome the massive traumatic life events that came along the way? This idea of being, going through adversity in life and just being so resilient that you can overcome it all is incomplete. It is not enough. We want people to be resilient, absolutely. But this idea that you can be so resilient that you can overcome things in or on your own in isolation is just not true. And so instead of just waiting for resilient young people to continue to go through hard things and, and get up from it and continue to moving forward, how can we support them so that they can be successful? How can we come alongside them so that they, it doesn't matter what they come face to face with, that they can be successful and resilient in the, in the face of insurmountable odds? There's a definition of trauma that says, trauma isn't what happens to you, it's what happens inside of you. Trauma isn't what happens to you, it's what happens inside of you. Uh, there's another quote that takes it a little bit further. That trauma isn't what happens to you, it's what happens inside of you in the absence of an empathetic witness. In the absence of an empathetic witness. Listening to MC earlier, essentially in the absence of a relational home. 
right? Yep. So how do we think about trauma and resilience? Because my whole life as a young kid that went through hard things, I heard well-meaning, awesome adults and professionals tell me, Galen, you're so resilient. But that's an, that's an it's on you kind of a thing, right? So how do we move from this binary response to just trauma and resilience into something that is bigger and more whole. Uh, Dr. Gabor Mate says that trauma is, like a, trauma is like a concussion. Trauma is like a concussion. It's not the big hit that I take in the game of football. It's the concussion that I receive as a result. To even go a little bit further, and I don't know if Gabor Mate, I've never met the man, don't know if he knows football as well as I might know football. I spent majority of my life in, in locker rooms, playing on football fields, competing, and it's one of the ways that I've experienced belonging at the highest rate as other communities in my life. And I know a little bit something about taking big hits, unfortunately. And what I've learned is that concussions don't come from the big hit that you take in the air. The concussion comes from the second hit of you hitting the ground. That a concussion comes from not just me being in a, in a bad position and having mid-air contact. It comes from me now hitting the ground without any support because of the big hit that I just went through. And I think that's such a great way to look at what trauma is. Trauma isn't simply just this presence of adversity in our lives. Trauma is this presence of adversity without the necessary support. Like MC said, without the relational home. And so it's not me experiencing the free fall. It's me experiencing collision with the ground. It's me being in it alone without an empathetic witness. This is where belonging comes into the equation. And so the reason we did the activity that we did is from this quote from author and poet Lois Bouchon. And she says, belonging is showing your authentic self and getting a thumbs up. Belonging is showing your authentic self and getting a thumbs up. So how am I presenting myself in this moment so I can experience the connection that I want to experience so I can be in the spaces that I want to be in? The activity in and of itself was putting you at this conflict of relationship and connection. There were people who were told they were supposed to judge, and there were people who were supposed to be judged. I didn't give you parameters on what to share to give you, I didn't give you a, a rubric on how to present the best fun fact about yourself. It just kind of threw you into the fire. And I didn't give them a grading scale. I didn't give you a criteria of how to do it. The reason I didn't give that is because life doesn't give us that. At any given moment, we are in, as social beings, trying to read a room to see how we best fit into it. We are trying to understand what is the path of least resistance so I can experience connection and belonging here. Because it's vital to our success. Now, you may not have put many thoughts into where you are sitting, but I promise you it was influenced by belonging in some way, shape, or form. I promise you it was influenced by it. Maybe you saw some, a familiar face. How many of us saw a familiar face and chose to sit where we sat today? A good amount of us. How many of us chose to sit where we sat because you wanted to be out a certain way of a doorway? Or you wanted to be able to access the doorway? I choose not to sit dead center because I'm always so concerned about who behind me cannot see. That's, that's the plight of being a tall person. I'll accept it. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. I'm thinking about you short people, of course. <laughs> But it's really the pressure that comes where I can't even focus because I'm concerned about how I'm becoming a, a barrier to someone else. And that changes how I can show up in a space. We are always processing at an extremely high rate where we fit in and where we don't. But here's the thing that's important, is that at the present moment we are in, there are previous experiences that people have that have shaped how they show up right now. So there are sometimes the young people you're serving that you care about directly don't even know who their authentic self is. It's just a version of what they've crafted to be in this moment right now. They've started to get thumbs up and thumbs down at times in their life where they've shown their authentic self. 
and they've been rejected, or they've been pushed away, or they've been left alone processing the hard thing that they've gone through, and it's changed how they've shown up right now. Behavior is not a mistake. The trauma response is not wrong. It is people are doing the best they can to get the best out of the moment they're currently in. And that is true for the young people that you serve and care for directly. They are a, a mesh of all of these aff affirmative and rejection-based experiences that they've had in their life. Very few of us will get rejected and remain unchanged. Very few of us who get a thumbs down in this small activity will go right confidently to the next person and do the exact same thing we just did. You're gonna change how you present it. You're gonna think more clearly about who you go to. You're going to change a lot of what you do in this activity. The unfortunate part is the young people have very little agency in how they step into the next thing. Who am I going to engage with? What home am I going to go to? What type of caseworker or foster parent am I going to have? They have very little control over those different details in their life. They just show up as the, the person or version of themselves that they think will get affirmed or the person version of themselves that will get rejected so quickly that it won't hurt as bad. Belonging is showing your authentic self and getting a thumbs up. It is a privilege to be able to show your authentic self. It is an absolute privilege. And it comes from being in spaces where you are safe enough to experience rejection and connection all in the same. And so, belonging is the safety net that catches us at the bottom of something that is hard. Belonging is the safety net that allows us to be our resilient full selves. I don't care how tough you are. I don't care how gifted you are. There will be a free fall in life that you cannot get up from on your own. And the thing about belonging and the thing about the safety net is that you can't hold your own net. Even people with infinite resources cannot hold their own net. This is why we see mental health issues with people with extremely wealthy backgrounds and communities. It's because it doesn't matter how many resources you have, if you don't have genuine, authentic relationship that catches you when life gets hard, you feel the impact of that. Your body will keep the score. And so the power of choosing belonging for the people in this room, it starts with us. It starts with us Understanding what is at stake, it starts with us choosing to prioritize this in everything that we do. It starts with us to give the freedom to show their authentic self in this safe environment. It's not gonna be perfect right away. It's not gonna be without pushback. It's not gonna be without failure. It's not gonna be without tears or heartbreak. But we have to choose to do the hard work so that they can experience the privilege of being their full self. This is what we're talking about today. So, come on, a little bit about me. So, that big-headed little baby right there is me, it is not my daughter that is in the back. We look alike. Don't tell my daughter she has a big head, we might fight. Yes, that is, my, that is me right there, but that's my baby, that's my twin back there. So, I have this, unfortunate hand dealt to me in life where I experienced free falls early and often. I entered foster care at the age of five months old and I would experience being removed from my home five times in my first five years of life. My parents met in rehab. They did not meet in this beautiful healed space of people being their authentic true selves. They met in a space where they felt immense shame. My parents, their experiences, their, their trauma that went unresolved, unfixed, unaddressed, the lack of belonging spaces that they were a part of directly influenced my experience. At four and a half years old, I was removed from, for the final time from my family. That was the final moment that our family was whole. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting at home 
My mom was home with me, my dad was at work, and my two sisters were at school. I was sitting, and I knew it, it, was, it was a good day, because I was sitting in the living room, and I was eating cereal, watching cartoons, and my dad would never let me sit in the living room and eat cereal and watch cartoons at the same time. It just didn't happen. But it was just me and my mom, so she was letting anything fly. That's when I could be my true authentic self. It was like, I'm not performing for anybody. I get to do what I want. This is my house. And I'm sitting there watching cartoons, and there's a knock on the door, and it's a man's voice who I did not know. There was a couple round of knocks before my mom finally appeared in the front of the apartment, but she was stressed. Immediately knew she was stressed, knew that there was something that was off about this. And, and my mom picked me up from the couch, and she put space in between me and our front door, or between us and the front door. And I just remember this man saying, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And then my mom finally got the courage to move. She unlocked the door and chaos ensued. This man who I would eventually find out is my caseworker, takes me out of the arms of my mom. And I remember kicking, fighting, doing what I could. Remember, I don't know this man. Doing anything I could to get out of his grasp and we turn the corner to uh, into the hallway of our apartment complex. And I stopped fighting the moment that I saw law enforcement waiting. He takes me to his car. I'm sitting in the car. He puts me in the front seat. It's, I don't have a car seat. He's, he's a social worker, but it's the 90s. So, you know, standards are a little bit lackadaisical. Puts me in the front seat, buckles me, and he asks, asks me to just wait there. I've never in my life listened to the instruction, just wait here. For whatever reason I did in that moment, like I, I didn't make a run for it, but in my head I was thinking, what can I do to fix this situation? This is four years old. Thinking about what can I do to fix this situation? I came up with the idea that, you know what? If I don't talk to anybody, maybe they'll send me back home. For whatever reason in my mind, I connected these dots that everyone said foster care was supposed to be really good for me. That it was supposed to be this thing that was best for me. And if I showed them that actually it was the opposite, that it was awful, that Galen wouldn't be himself, that he wouldn't connect, that I wouldn't laugh, that I wouldn't be who I normally was, maybe they would just give up and send me back home. And so I make that decision. My caseworker comes back to the car and I have this slight like quick change of plans. You're like, you know what? I don't know this man. I'm gonna give him a chance. He gets in the car. He puts my bag in the back seat. He turns around. He has a blue milk crate full of action figures. And went, just side note, actual action figures that can move. If you give a young boy a toy that does not bend at the knees and elbows, it is not an action figure. It is a Barbie. Just letting you know. He got me a real action, he had a basket full of real action figures that, that even, they even swiveled at the hips, which were like <laughs> chef's kiss. And I remember thinking like, okay, this is a good start. I make eye contact with a Venom action figure that I was like, ooh, I really want that one. He had nice big muscles, I was really excited. And before I could grab him out of the crate, we started to drive away. And I was like, okay, that's odd. And we lived in a cul-de-sac, so we drove to the end of the, the cul-de-sac, turned around, and we were driving back up. And as I am still trying to process that we're moving already and that we're leaving already, I look at my apartment complex, which we're about to drive back through. And so I'm in the passenger seat, my caseworker is here, and I'm looking through the driver's side at our apartment complex. And my mom is on the front lawn, face down, being restrained by law enforcement. And I had this moment of like, panic. And I wanted this man who I said I would give a shot to, to do something, to say something. And I saw him see me see him, right? Like I, he's driving, I know he knows I see him. And he reached for the radio and he turned it up. And we just drove in silence. The only thing I thought about in that car ride was I have to commit to what I said I would do, which was not talk to anybody, which was not connect with anyone. I knew that 
or I believe that that was the only option available to me. Over the next 18 months of my life, I would stay in over 10 different foster homes. Most of them saying, Galen won't connect with us. Most of them saying, Galen won't speak to me. Most of them saying, we don't feel like we're a good place for him. In a moment where I was four and a half years old and I was experiencing a free fall, I was hoping that there would be someone holding a net. And there wasn't. I was, without a relational home, experiencing one of the hardest things that any young child could experience, which is being separated from the people who created him. And I was just left to kind of deal with and pick up the pieces. And so I got very cold at that point in my life. I got very uh, anti the system. I got very clear on what I stood for and what I didn't stand for. But those experiences early on in my development would shape how I would make decisions for the rest of my life would shape how I enter into relationship for the rest of my life. And so I'm not here because that experience or that line of thinking ended up winning out. I'm here because I ended up having experiences that counteracted it enough that I started to be able to replace these negative soundtracks for ones that are life-giving. I started to be able to have positive relational experiences where people were holding a net, even when I least expected it. And so I know that you love the, the kids that you're in relationship dearly. You would not be in this room if you didn't. I know that there is a way that you've committed to something very, very hard, that there are people out there that you live day-to-day -day life with that have no idea of what you've stepped into. But I'm telling you, the kids that we are in this room for need us to accept and commit and choose belonging long before they ever understand what it looks like. Long before they are ever able to really choose belonging for themselves. We have to model it. So we're going to talk about a couple of those things today. So what is belonging in a, in a science-based definition? Because belonging is something that is loosey-goosey, it's pie in the sky, it's, it's hard to pin down and nail down. There is a long line of believers that think belonging is being liked, appreciated, welcomed, invited, all of these fluffy ideas, and it's not. It has nothing to do with those things. Those things might be a physical experience of something deeper that is connected to belonging, but just because you give, I'm in your class and you give me a birthday invitation does not mean that there's some belonging relationship that is present there. You know how many things I've been invited to but unable to go? You know how many things I've been, oh, Galen, you can come, but it's been an afterthought about how can Galen actually get there? Belonging is so much more than these simple words that some of our people that we rub shoulders with will use to disqualify this kind of belief. Well, everyone's not going to be liked. There's, I wish I was welcomed everywhere I went. No, those are people that are trying to stop this conversation about belonging, not people that are trying to bring it everywhere we go, make it accessible to every single young person in our communities. So it's more than that. It's a definition from Carl Rogers that says, Karen, a unique and subjective experience that relates to three things. Three things, the yearning for connection with others, the need for positive regard, and the desire for personal connection. Three things. I call it the core three of belonging, and I think it's a great North Star as we have these conversations. Okay, yearning for connection, what does this mean? Yearning for connection is about the, the larger community or group at whole. It is not one-on-one -on -one relationship, but being a part of something that is bigger than myself. Yearning for connection is, is really important because it's not this want to be connected. It's not this nice to have idea of being connected. It's a yearning. It is something that is driving our decisions at every moment as we interact with other people. As introverted as some, some of you in this room might be, you still yearn to be connected with others. You might need to be alone a little bit to recharge, which is foreign to me, I don't understand that concept. 
I'm, our family, we are a family of extroverts through and through. But introverts still need people too. You still need to be in community with others. Yearning is so important because there's, a, there's ongoing neuroscience that talks about this importance of connection. They've actually found that the same neural networks, neural pathways that communicate hunger and thirst, communicate lack of belonging and connection. So the same parts of our brain that fires when we don't have the nutrients that we need to show up in spaces are the same neural networks that fire when we don't have the connection that we need. They've been able to connect physical pain with that of lacking connection and social pain. They call it so social pinches. The same part of our brain that processes physical pain processes social pain. Our brain is, has a specific part of it that is hardwired for connection. It is a vital need, vital component to human flourishing. It's not, well, it's nice if you have it. It's something we all need to be our best selves. Dr. Bruce Perry's brain model, and I'm not gonna go super deep into the brain because I thought what MC shared about it was phenomenal. I'm, Dr. Bruce Perry's brain model, he shares it often, but most recently in his What Happened to You uh, book with Dr. Oprah Winfrey, and they talk about the four categories of the brain, which again, I feel like we've learned enough about, but I wanna talk about these questions that are associated with each part of the brain. In our brain stem, which is the most instinctual aspect of our existence, it is the most uh, uncontrolled part of our human functioning that we have, we are answering the question of, am I safe? In the diencephalon, we are asking the question of, am I safe in this space right now? In the limbic system, we are asking the question of, am I loved or do I fit in? The reason there are two questions there is because it depends on the relationship that we are talking about. In a room of peers like this, it might matter that you fit in, that you are someone that, are, that is welcomed into this space, that you have a connection that is being met, that you have positive regard, that all those things show up in this space, but you don't need to be loved by everybody in this room. But when I'm a child, it doesn't matter that I fit in with my family, it matters that I'm loved by them. So there's different levels to that relationship. In this, we can see, um, or based on what question is being answered gives us access to the next part of our brain, of our human functioning. So if I don't know that I am safe, I don't care if I fit in or if I'm loved. My brain is, is in stress response. It's shutting down, it's doing whatever it can to respond in the moment. This is where fight, flight, freeze happen. We know stress response is a natural biological function to respond to a threat. Where it becomes traumatic is if the threat persists and our body can't regulate itself and come down from that high stress level, that high um, state of uh, stress and anxiety that comes with that. If we can't resolve that in a timely manner, it becomes traumatic to our nervous system it becomes traumatic to our quality of life and our quantity of life. If we get that question answered, then I'm worried and focused on am I loved or do I fit in? If we can't answer that in a timely manner, we don't have access to our cortex, which is where we ask the question of what can I learn from this? The, the librarian or the teacher, sorry, new to this terminology too. What can I learn from this? What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. The reality is for a, a human, the only result that I need is that I survived what I've gone through. The primary focus and mission of our brain is to keep us alive. And so I might not be making decisions that are helping me learn from the situation that I'm going through, but if, as long as I'm surviving that, it's good enough for me. If we're not engaging people so that they know that they're safe, that they fit in, that they're loved, they aren't concerned about the best, most healthy and helpful way to survive or to learn from this current situation. 
I just need to know that, hey, I'm still here. And so the, the definition of insanity doesn't really apply to someone who's in stress response. It doesn't apply to someone who's, um, whose body has been in fight, flight, or freeze consistently throughout their development. We want so badly for the young people, that, the young children that we are caring for, that we are loving, that we are in relationship with, to learn from the situations that they've gone through. But until we can give them the relational support, the relational home, to process what they're going through, they're not gonna get there. They've seen in brain scans of adults who have experienced consistent and unrelenting childhood trauma, and their brainstem has been overdeveloped, and their cortex is underdeveloped. This is where we get emotional and, or emotional ages that are different than our biological age. Right? This is where you get a 24 year old that might be 13. Because there has been something out of whack where they haven't had the same access to their cortex because they've been forced to be in survival mode. It is vital for us to understand how the body is going to respond to adversity and traumatic things if they don't have the support and connection they need to respond in an adequate and healthy way. The other two things um, that I, I just remember that I went over, so yearning for connection, those three core needs of belonging. Yearning for connection is talking about the group or community of people. The need for positive regard is this this um, belief that's set in stone, that is concrete, that there are people and relationships in my life who care about me beyond what I can do or provide for them. It's important for every person, especially every young person, to know that there are people in their life who love them with no strings attached, who care about their well-being, even if I don't have the ability to show up as my best self in this space. But think about how that belief isn't something that's easily accessible in our current day and time. There's so much about how much value or importance the belonging that we experience, the positive regard that we have available in our life that is dependent on what we do and who we are. I need to have this kind of behavior to experience this kind of connection. I need to have these kind of grades to be able to experience these kind of extracurriculars. There's so many things that are contingent on compliance and not connection. The third part of that, that uh, core three of belonging that, I, again, I skipped over is a desire for personal connection. And this is kind of like the most important, but it, it, it comes last. It's this innate, sorry, innate desire that we all have to have relationships, people in our life who know us below the surface. The reason that, that kind of comes last is because we have to understand for young kids who've had traumatic experiences with adults and caregivers, I'm not just going to easily trust and open up again. That I have to have some relationships yearning for connect, or connection to this community of people and I need to have positive regard in a way that allows me to start to trust again. Brene Brown talks about true belonging being contingent on trusting yourself and trust in the community of people you have around you. Are you willing to trust yourself in relationship? And do you have people that you can put trust in to experience true and authentic belonging? The reason I wanted to uh, bring those three things back up again is because think about how those show up in the top three sources of belonging for all youth across the board. Regardless of if you have, you have a trauma background, regardless of where you come from, if you've never experienced an ounce of adversity in your life, we know you have, but the top three sources of belonging are family, school, and community. Top three sources for belonging for youth. Unfortunately, we see that young people who experience trauma in their childhood and early developmental years have an adverse relationship with these three things in some way, shape, or form. I've either been severed from family, and we've been separated, and I've had to, on the fly, develop this new understanding and idea of what family looks like, 
Oftentimes the trauma manifests itself in a way that in school I can't behave or comply in the way that my peers do, and so I get alienated. You see, and especially in kind of that five-year-old, that early school, early childhood education, if you can't behave the way that everyone else does, you get alienated very quickly. And so family school and community, which we know the stigma that comes behind uh, being a part of the communities that the young people, the young children you care for are a part of, we know the stigma that comes with the, the generational trauma tag. Oh, you're one of them. Oh, that's where you come from. I knew, I, I knew your name sounded familiar. It creates an adverse relationship with family school and community. So there's a deficit that I'm already having to navigate in the top three sources of belonging and connection if we aren't intentionally choosing it for the young people, the young children we care for. They are lacking access to the top three sources. So how do we go out of our way so that we can try to cover that gap, so we can erase the deficit that they're navigating? It's not gonna happen without intentionality. It's not gonna happen Oh, we, we love our community. Our community loves us. It'll all work itself out. It doesn't. Because our society does not work in a way that chooses belonging for those that lack it. Our society is hardwired to move as though everyone is getting their belonging needs where they're supposed to, which is at home. And we just know that's not true. If you look at the original uh, 10 categories for the original ACES study, they all have an adverse or negative relationship with family school community. So we can draw some correlation, it's not causation, but we can draw some correlation between lacking belonging and ACEs. Is that my, yep, that's my babies. <laughs> this is um, a study that Dr. Bruce Perry did and he labeled it relational poverty that he did for a child that was recently placed in foster care compared to a child in their normal context. And for two weeks, over 24 hour periods, they tracked the amount of positive relational interactions that a child recently placed within the last 60 days and a child in their normal context had with people in their life. And this had to be an interaction that the child agreed was positive and that the person on the other end agreed was also positive. And on the left, you can see the one with more dots is the child in their normal context. And on the right is a child who's the foster child. And so over a two week period, they saw a 41 to 10 ratio of positive relational interactions. 41 to 10, that's a four to one ratio. Again, if we're thinking about relationship, connection, belonging gives me access to my cortex, gives me access to this part of my brain that is asking the question, what can I learn from this? That is a 41 to 10 ratio of me sitting in class, not being able to focus on what the teacher is teaching, but more focus on the lack that I have in my relationships. It's a, it's, a diff, it's a deficit personified, and that's why Dr. Bruce Perry can call it relational poverty. Because when kids are going through transition, maybe they're, they're losing some stable relationship or connection in their life, we just push them through. It'll, it'll figure itself out eventually. After they were able to recognize this in a two-week study, they ever, the, the agency, the school, and the families made intentional decisions to make sure that the kid that was recently placed had more relational support, had more positive interactions. And although they saw a massive decrease in the grades between those two students, by eventually they intervened and chose something different, both students were almost identical in their success academically. So oftentimes we are judging young people based on certain things of, well, if, if you are compliant, if you get the grades or you do the homework that we ask you to, you get more freedom. And when you get more freedom, more privileges, you get to experience more connection. And it becomes this cycle that, which is how our world works. But the reality is if you give people more connection, if you give them more relationship, more belonging, they will do better. And when they do better, they experience more belonging, and it becomes a positive cycle that isn't dependent on the compliance. 
a 41 to 10 ratio. So this is why belonging lens matters, because if we don't intentionally step in, we let the ability to take a hit determine how successful a child can be. We let the ability to withstand a fall be the determining factor if you have a life that is hopeful or not. There's so much of us that have been led to believe that you just gotta be resilient and continue to get up, fall seven times, get up eight, and things will work out. But we know life just doesn't work that way. And so how do we think about things differently? Normal culture says if you behave a certain way and you believe certain things, then you get to experience belonging. What we're saying as we choose belonging, is, as we talk about the power of belonging, is that first and foremost, inherently, every young person, every kid that I care for, that I come into contact with, first and foremost, you belong here. And then we believe, over time, your behaviors and belief will change. But it's not, you don't belong because your behavior and beliefs will change. You belong no matter what. You might not change an inch. You might not open up an iota. You might not, there might not be anything different in your experience and how you show up in this space. But even still, you belong. That is the type of commitment we need. That is the type of commitment that the young children that you know, that you love, and that you care for need from you. Not one that is this exchange. Oftentimes, I, get, I interact with adoptive foster parents. I interact with people who are like, we just want to help these young kids that are looking for a return on their investment. And that's not what we're committing to here. When you step into this, I'm not saying there isn't something to be hopeful for, to wish for, to look forward to, but if you are making the, the if you are inserting into this space with the expectation that you're gonna get something in return, then you're gonna let yourself down severely or you're gonna let the young person down that you're serving severely. Because at some point, if you're not getting a return on your investment, you will walk away. You will give up on them. You will say, you know what, maybe I'm not the one that's supposed to be holding this particular net. And then what? That's a thumbs up or a thumbs down experience that we have that will change how they show up in the future. You know, I was really hopeful that Megan was going to be someone that was going to hold my net this time. Maybe I'm less hopeful this next time. Maybe I'm less willing to believe that there's someone out there that's gonna to try to do that for me. And so we have to know that this is an invitation that we are extending that does not require anyone to RSVP. That does not require anyone to accept. It is an open invitation. It is here when you are ready to accept. That is what belonging looks like. That is what the young children in your community, in your sphere of influence, in Mendocino County, need. So how did I get that despite all the things that I went through? I ended up, unfortunately, um, after the, the year and a half of going in over 10 different foster homes, I found myself in a home. At six years old, I was in kindergarten. I was placed with my two biological sisters for the first time since we were separated from my family. They thought, you know, Galen's struggling in all these other homes. Maybe we'll just put him back with people that he, he knows and loves and likes, and he'll do okay. Turns out, if you put people who belong together in a space that will suffocate belonging, they're not going to stick together that long. I moved into this new foster home with my two sisters, and within days, I started to be physically abused. Within days for not eating my food, for not making my bed in the way that I was supposed to, I was accused of eating toothpaste, overslept, missed the bus. There were so many things that I experienced abuse for. I remember the first time that I experienced the abuse in this home, my two sisters had already been in the home without me. So they kind of had an idea, a read on how things worked. And I remember after we left the house for the first time, after I had experienced abuse, we were headed to the bus stop. And I immediately sought out my sisters to be comforted. I immediately wanted to find that net. So I sought my sister out, I ran up to her as she was on the way to the bus stop, and I was wanting to be held by my bigger sister who was seven years older than me. 
and she put out her arm. And I love my sister. I'm still in a relationship with her today. But she put out her arm and she said, Galen, if you don't get it together, you're going to make it harder on the rest of us. And so it doesn't matter if you have these little moments of belonging. This person who had authority over all of us was able to divide us, to make it a, a zero-sum game. If I belong, then that means they can't. And if they belong, that means I don't. Which is what a lot of us believe in our adult lives. We believe sometimes that, you know what, if they're here, that must mean that this isn't the space for me, so I'm going to bow out. But that's what I was navigating as a young kid who just had committed to, you know what, if I shut people out, maybe things will work out my way. And now I'm in a space that is physically and relationally and emotionally unsafe. So in 18 months, I stayed in over 10 different homes. I'm placed in this new home when I'm in kindergarten. And I stay there for five and a half years. There's not a foster home in my 20 plus foster homes that I stayed in that I stayed in longer than a year, except the abusive one. Stayed in there, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, halfway through it, me and one of my sisters decided to run away. We run away, we were gone for over a month. Stayed anywhere we could, eventually turned ourselves in. When we turned ourselves in, they were like, hey, these kids have been missing for almost a month. They investigated why we were running away, why we were gone for so long. The investigation got us removed from the home. Within weeks, I was returned with my biological father. Within weeks of this traumatic and stressful thing, I'm reunified with the people who I always thought I would belong with. Now, before I got reunified with my dad, I played this, this sport ball, where, this sport ball activity called football. <laughs> and it was the first time, I'm in sixth grade, it was the first time that I had been able to do an extracurricular in my life. In my life. I had never done a club. My foster parent, my, my abuser did not let me do any extracurriculars. I didn't do sports. I didn't do field trips that cost money. I didn't do birthdays. I didn't do sleepovers. I didn't do any of it. So in sixth grade, when I was given the thumbs up to play football, I was ready. So in weeks preparing, I'm, I, like, I have my outfit that I'm wearing to practice laid out. I'm watching everything I can get my hands on to prepare for my first time playing football. I'm watching MTV Two Days. I'm watching Friday Night Lights. YouTube is new at this time, but I'm watching any highlight on YouTube that I can get my hands on. I knew that once I was on a team, I was going to be ready. And so I joined the team. In our first practice, I was terrified. I was struggling. I didn't know what to do. Didn't know how to respond in those moments. But the first part of it went really well. And then we closed with this drill called the Oklahoma Drill. Now, there are some states that have kind of outlawed the Oklahoma drill. Like, they've since accepted, like, maybe this isn't good for young kids to be doing. But it is kind of the most stereotypical football drill there is. Um, it is, we're going to put you a certain amount of distance apart, and then when we say go, run in and see who can take the most hits. Like, see who can win. And I was terrified because I knew all the shows, the movies that I watched made a big deal about this drill. So I was like, Galen, you better come correct. Don't mess this up. This is your chance. And so I get up. I'm on defense. I'm going against two kids. My coach said, you're a bigger kid. We're going to put two kids against you. I can't believe you thought I was a bigger kid. Like I... So I get down on my stance. There's two people I'm going against. And before I get down, I ask the coach, what's the snap count? The coach responds, says, it's on two. If you know anything about football, the snap count is the cadence that you hike the ball. But if you know anything about football, you know the defense doesn't know the snap count. So I get down on my stance, I'm on defense, I'm waiting for the, the coach to say down set hut a second time. And before I even lift my hand off the ground, I'm hit by the two kids I'm going against. I fall back, my head hits the ground, and I'm looking up at the sky. They had moved on one. The actual snap count was one. Uh, because they were on offense, my coach told me to, wanted to teach me a lesson. Defense doesn't know what the snap count is, just move when the ball moves. I'm on the ground, my teammates and coaches are laughing, I start to, I start to tear up. I got sad. I felt like, man, I really thought football was going to be my thing, but it's just one in the same of every other experience that I've had. 
They moved on to the next drill. They, they skipped past me. They didn't even help me up. I was just on the ground crying. I get up. I walk back into the drill. I grab the kid that walked in because of me. Poor kid. Had nothing to do with it. I snatched him out of the drill. I looked at my coach and said, I'm going again. He brings up the two kids that I just went against. I get down on my stance. My coach again says, it's on two. In my head, I'm like, F you. I'm going when I want to. And so I get down on my stance. First sound, I take off. I knock one kid down. I take the other kid to the sidewalk because I was just mad. I was, I was a little hot headed. I was mad. Took him to the sidewalk. Coaches in practice. My teammates lift me up and celebrate. And it was the most glorious thing that I had ever experienced in my childhood. And I remember thinking that day, this is it. This will be the thing that I do for the rest of my life. And in this little bubble, I started to experience community. I started to experience connection. I started to experience belonging. And it started to be a vehicle for me to experience things that I didn't experience elsewhere. This little old sport ball game of football. And football continued to be this avenue of belonging, relationship, and connection where I felt like I could be my true self there. That I didn't need to bring in all this other baggage that I had, that I was just another kid trying to fight for the same thing that everyone else was fighting for. And it continued to play a massive role in my experience. So much so that as I moved back with my dad, the one thing, despite all the adversity and things that we went through, that I wanted to do no matter what was play football. So I move out of this town once I'm reunified with my dad, seventh grade, sign me up for football. That's all I want to do. I'm in a totally new school, struggling to find relationships, but I'm like, I'm going to play football. We experienced extreme poverty that winter for the first time in my life. First time in my life, I'm going to bed with my winter coat on because we don't have heat or gas, but I'm still trying to play football. We move from that town, go to a rural Wisconsin town in eighth grade, totally different from being in the inner city. We, excuse me, we struggled financially there, homeless, living wherever we could, played football. Freshman year, moved to a new town, new school, new environment. Now it's even more rural than what I was just a part of. We had, we had a couple questionable uh, homecoming festivities type things like cowboy or tractor days and different things like that. Like we, I don't know if you guys know about that up here. <laughs> no, okay. We, we, you still belong in this, this story, in this conversation. That's all good. But totally different exper experience than what I was used to. But I'm playing football. My sophomore year of high school was the first time that I stayed in the same school since fifth and sixth grade. So I was familiar. I was connected. I was comfortable. And then halfway through my sophomore year of high school, my dad got arrested. And so immediately I felt like the safety net was removed from my life. That I was free falling again. And instead of hoping that people would help me pick up the pieces this time, I was ready to go do life on my own. As a 16 year old honor roll student, varsity starter on football and basketball, everyone outside looking in, Galen has his future in front of him. I experienced this free fall and I was ready to drop out of high school and run away. Left the office committed to throwing it all away because I was done trusting that other people would do right by me. I was, I was giving up. And then as I'm in the hallway, I'm pursued, my high school football coach uh, extends the invitation for me to come live with him and his family. He, I don't, he didn't know that I was gonna drop out, he just knew that I didn't have a home and he was gonna extend an invitation for me to come live with him and his family. Immediately I said, thank you, but no thank you. And I continued to try to go about my day. At the end of the school day, my high school coach is parked out front. He was our gym teacher, our health teacher, our driver's ed teacher, and our football coach. <laughs> and he was parked out front with the FIAD car ready for me to get in. I thought about making a run for it, just a little bit. My coach, if you can't tell, was a short, kind of bald, round, white man. I was like, you're not gonna catch me if I run. <laughs> But I had so much respect for the fact that he followed through. And so I got in. I got in thinking, you know what, this will be a two week little kind of vacation and then they'll put me back into the system and then I'll run away from there. 
And then two weeks became two months. Two months became the rest of the school year. The rest of the school year became my junior year. And things just didn't change. They just continued to get better. And they continued to feel more and more like belonging, like a community. And through that relationship, not overnight, because some people think you do this great grand gesture, things change overnight. It was not easy for anybody, his family included, but it got better over time. And it was with his consistency, his family's consistency, that they were able to help me, this kid who had been fighting the world his entire life, start to let go of control for a little bit. And start to try to figure out what does it look like to be a part of something that is more than just being alone. Through, well really, 10 months after moving into my coach's home, I had my first scholarship offer to play football in college. It was the University of Minnesota. I had many scholarship offers that came after that, but I decided to go to the University of Minnesota. The reason, I can say this now, I didn't, I didn't know why, I couldn't explain it then. The reason I went to the University of Minnesota, 35 minutes from where I went to high school. The people who had invested in me would still be there. The thing about genuine, authentic belonging is that it's something we fight for after we experience it. It's something we will genuinely fight for tooth and nail if we can experience it in our lives. I had been dead set my entire childhood that I wanted to be a professional athlete. And to be honest, the University of Minnesota was not the best pathway to be a professional athlete. But I felt like I had the support system that I would need going there. That I didn't want to move across country and be in this whole totally different area without a support system once again. Belonging will change how we show up. So the final thing that I want to communicate to you is this thing called the belonging meta framework. And I think it's going to take everything we've talked about, everything you've learned, and put it in tangible, bite-sized tools of application for you. So the belonging meta framework is a line of thinking that talks about all the things that everyone experiences that influences your belonging perception, your belonging experience in life. The belief is that competency opportunity, perception, and motivation will influence our belonging at all times. What does that mean? So competency is having a set of skills and abilities needed to connect with people and the things around us. Do you have competency, both subjective and objective? Do I have tangible skills that allow me to be a part of something, but do I have the social and emotional skills to connect with other people? Opportunity is the availability of groups, people, places, times, and spaces that enable belonging to occur. Motivation is a, okay. Motivation is a personal belief, need, or desire to connect with others. Are you motivated to even put yourself out there? Are you motivated to even be vulnerable enough to get that thumbs up or thumbs down in that moment? And then perception, a person's subjective feelings and cognitions concerning their past and previous experiences. So let's, let's think about this. And the team of international psychologists that came up with this framework, the team of international psychologists that came up with this framework, uh, basically, they focus on school belonging for adolescents. They don't focus on like the intersection of trauma and belonging. But they basically believe these things at all times are changing someone's belonging experience. And the reason it's a meta framework is because you can pick any starting point and you can see how it flows into the other three. So if I'm a competent person, if I have skills that people see value in, if I'm able to connect with other people, it makes me experience more belonging, right? We, we all love being around people who are competent. The kids who are popular in school are the ones that can either con like command a room or are really good at things. Competency will influence and boost our belonging experience, but also opportunity will change your belonging experience well. How often are you given the chance to connect with other people? How often are you given the chance to see that you add value to the spaces that you're in? Motivation, and that's, Again, motivation, that's more of a personal internal thing. 
How motivated am I to even put myself out there? As a young kid experienced the things that I experienced, I didn't put myself out there very much. Wasn't motivated to because I had experienced letdowns time and time again. And so any natural person after being let down consistently will start to putting up walls and stop putting themselves out there so much and being vulnerable. And then perception, how do you perceive the things in your past and how does it change how you perceive things right now? Let me give you an example. Let's talk about riding a bike. At what age do young kids start learning how to ride a bike? Three to five. I heard a couple later, I didn't learn how to ride a bike until I was in fifth grade. Didn't learn how to ride a bike until I was in fifth grade because my abuser didn't care about me learning how to ride a bike. Learning how to ride the bike in and of itself is competency, correct? It's a competency, it's a skill. Now, let's say all the kids in my neighborhood ride the bikes to school together every morning. There's a caravan of 10 kids who ride their bike to school every morning. Say I'm walking distance, I'm in the neighborhood, so I should be able to ride a bike too, but because I can't ride the bike, I can't go with them. So now I'm missing out on the opportunity to experience belonging and connection that my peers are. So if I'm lacking out on that opportunity, I may start to be less motivated to connect to those kids later. Like, oh shoot, they're, they're probably laughing and joking about the thing that happened on the way to school today. I'm just, I'm just not gonna put myself out there. Or I'm gonna stop trying to see if they will open up the, the doorway for me to be a part of it. Maybe it's like, hey, can we walk some days? I don't wanna admit that I'm not competent, that I don't know how to ride a bike. Maybe I don't even have a bike. Maybe I don't even have a bike to ride. But over time, you might start to believe that because they have this shared experience, that I'm just not one of them. That they have this thing that they connect over. And so maybe I see when I walk into the classroom and they're, they're whispering about something, that they're maybe making fun of me instead of me going to ask, like, hey, what's, what are we talking about? It's a difference of perception. And you can see how lacking that particular skill or ability can filter into all these other experiences and create this negative obstacle to experience belonging. Become this barrier. So much about what we do, and again, this exchange, so much about serving vulnerable kids, serving kids that go through hard things, that are dealing with adversity and trauma in their life. We think of, we want to change their motivation and perception of the things they've gone through. We want kids to think that they're worthy of more. If I'm successfully caring for this young person, that they will start to see themselves in the way that I see them. This internal focus on changing their perspective and their motivation. But what I'm telling you is, that's a dead end. My coach didn't invite me to be a part of his home because he just wanted to change my perception and motivation. He saw an opportunity to equip and support me. The way that we can get the ball rolling in the belonging experience for the kids in our lives is by building competency and giving them opportunities to experience connection. Giving them the competency required and giving them access to opportunity. When, when I listened to the eight different types of awe earlier this morning, those ways that we can experience joy, I, I saw through the lens of belonging. Like those are eight different ways that we can experience connection with other people, but how do we apply the, even something as tangible as that into this framework of competency and opportunity? Oh, if one of these, uh, one of those eight is, um, let's say art, how do we not just let young children experience the all that comes from art, but help them create art that is all like that is awesome in and of itself? so that other people can admire what they're a part of, what they've created, what they, the value that they're adding in any space at any given moment. Competency is the thing that starts to get the ball rolling and we have to provide opportunities. Martha Holden, who does a lot of work in residential uh, congregate care, like communities for young people, she talks about competency in this way and I think it's so important. It's the ability to negotiate with everyday life the ability to negotiate with everyday life. We have to be people that are gonna build competency in the young people that we care for. That's competency in skills, 
but it's competency in social emotional connection. The only way we can do that is by giving them opportunities to apply that, but modeling it for them. Modeling what these things look like, modeling what it looks like to be a part of a community, to show them what positive regard looks like in their life. As we choose belonging in these ways, as you choose belonging to think differently, not to make connection contingent on compliance, but connection just as right that everyone has, you choose belonging by building competency and giving opportunities, we get to see the ball rolling for their future. You get to see the, see the momentum building for what is possible in their life. I went throughout most of my life thinking that the value I brought into the spaces that I was a part of was my ability to go through hard things. That's what I attached my value to. And the reality is one day I woke up and realized, you know what, I don't want to have to go through hard things. I don't want to have to be someone that has to lean into just biting my teeth and, and overcoming something that's difficult or traumatic. When I started to see the power of connection, of being vulnerable, of being my true self, is when more relationship, more connection, more belonging experiences started to present themselves. We cannot, being someone who was able to go through hard things allowed me to make it to the National Football League. But seeing, being someone whose value was attached to going through hard things made me leave the National Football League. I got there because I was able to go through really hard things. But because my value was ascribed to that very belief, I had to leave. Because at the mountaintop of success in my life, I felt so alone and unknown. Didn't know who I was. I had convinced myself my entire life, if I made it there, it would fix every bad thing that I would ever gone through in my childhood. It would reunite my family. It would make me someone that adds value to the spaces that I'm in. And it didn't. We can be so focused on material success for the young children that we care for and love that we miss the bigger picture entirely. True success is not making it to the NFL. Success is choosing relationship and connection even after having every reason not to. The reality is, the young children that have experienced the things that your children have experienced have every legitimate reason to push people away. They don't need anything, a more valid reason to reject connection than the ways that they've already been harmed. True success is getting them to see the value of choosing connection anyway. And so you can be at the mountaintop of material or physical success and still be entirely alone. So how do we prepare them for, for seeing the value that they add to relationship and genuine connection rather than the ways that they perform for it? Rather, the, giving them a chance to experience their true and authentic self rather than the version that they've created to get the thumbs up that they need in life. There's so much importance in the, in the ways that we're engaging with the young people right now. But the most important is that they see that they are worthy of belonging. That it's not just that I am able to go through hard things. My value isn't contingent on my ability to withstand hard falls, but I am a valuable person regardless of how I respond to the hard falls in my life. There's, there's a really cool quote from so, psychologist Greg Walton, and he does a lot of belonging work with uh, universities. I, he's at the University of Stanford right now, but he does a lot of belonging work with young, like even middle schoolers about how do you experience belonging in the spaces you're in. And he said something I, that I wanna leave you with today. He said, belonging is not the elimination of hard things. He said, belonging is not the elimination of hard things but belonging 
is a separation from hard things from my identity. Belonging allows me to separate the hard things that I go through from who I am inherently as a person. Instead of me processing not having the childhood that I think I deserved or not having what my peers had, I'm processing it as I'm still worthy of the things I did not have. Even though I still experience the things that I went through. So much about going through traumatic things, it can become this label. It, become, it can become this solo identifier in your experiences and through all your relationships. Belonging is helping people separate that from who they are and just seeing it as bad things happen, doesn't define who I am, and it allows you to keep choosing belonging going forward. So I thank you for the ways that you are doing that right now. I thank you for all the hard nights or hard days that you might have had being rejected and getting a thumbs down in your own home. But know that you are doing that so that they can have the freedom and the privilege of knowing their authentic true self at some point in their life. And it's not gonna happen until someone starts to choose belonging in their experience long before they do. So thank you.